Hello, in this example we want to examine a transformation which maps from R3 to R2 via the following t of xyz equals x plus z in the first component, y in the second component. So several things to show here. We want to show that t is a linear transformation. We also want to find the kernel and the range as well as the dimension of those subspaces. We want to find the domain of t, verify the rank nullity theorem, and lastly we'll write a, a matrix representation of t. So let's get started. The first task here is to show that t is a linear transformation. So let's write that down. Show t is a linear transformation and there's two properties we need to show here. To show that t is a linear transformation we need to show that the additive property as well as the scalar multiplication property hold. So let's pick vectors u and v in the domain which was r3 that means vector u looks like some x, y, z and vector v looks something like a, b, c. And now we want to examine whether t of u plus t of v, does that give us t of u plus v? Well, t of u looks like, if we go back to our transformation here, it looks like x plus z comma y. So it looks like x plus z comma y. In other words, we're taking the uh, first and third components, adding them up, and that gives us our output for the first component, and then the second component is just kind of a copy-paste. All right, so t of v would be a plus c comma b. Adding those vectors up, we get a x plus a plus z plus c and y plus b and a moment's thought shows us um, that that is actually the same as t of u plus plus v. And I'll kind of write out all the steps there. That's, that's t of x plus a, y plus b, and a z plus c. And again the rule is that we take our first and third components that becomes the sum that's in the first component and the second component is kind of a copy paste. So the additive property holds. The other thing we need to show is that for any scalar, for any k in the real numbers and u in our domain set, we need to verify that k times t of u is the same as t of k times u. So k times t of u, that gives us k times x plus z comma y. Performing scalar multiplication we get kx plus kz equals ky. And again what we're trying to see is that equal to t of ku and certainly it is because ku just looks like kx, ky, kz and again the rule that T performs is that you take the first and third components, add them up, and that becomes the first component of the output. So indeed this is a linear transformation. T is a linear transformation. The next thing we wanted to explore was uh, the kernel. So let's find the kernel of T. So the kernel of T uh, by definition, by definition the kernel of T is the set of vectors from the domain that map to the zero vector in the codomain. So this is the set of vectors of the form x, y, z such that t of x, y, z equals our zero vector. And keep in mind that the zero vector is in the codomain 
which in this particular problem is R2. So we're looking for vectors that map to the vector 0, 0. Again, let's go back. Codomain was given in the problem. So this was our codomain. And this set over here was our domain. A picture of what we're looking for is something like the following. Uh, here's our domain set. Let me put that a different color. Here's our domain set, R3. This is our domain. And our codomain lives over here. That was R2 for this particular example. And what T does is T is a rule that assigns vectors in R3 to vectors in R2. So we're looking for the vectors that map to the zero vector over here in R2. So we're looking for all the little vectors that map to zero. And certainly not every vector uh, maps to the zero, zero vector. But there's some of them that do. In this set that maps to the zero vector, that's called the kernel of t. And that's what we seek in this problem. OK, so back to our work here. So far, we've deciphered that uh, kernel of t is the set of vectors x, y, z, such that t of x, y, z is 0, 0. Now let's go back. t of x, y, z, the definition we remembered from above, that is just x plus z comma y. So let's plug that in. We get x plus z comma y, and that's supposed to equal to the zero vector. So solving from here, this condition right here tells us that x plus z must equal 0. So that implies that x equals negative z. And similarly, the second components must be equal, so y equals 0. So the kernel of t looks like the set of vectors x, y, z. We know more than that now. We know the first component, if it's x, then the third component must be negative x. and y is 0. So what this condition right here tells us that x and z, x is equal to negative 1 times z, or they're equal to each other, but there's a sign change. And that's what we've encoded right here. So x is any real number. And you might be wondering what this space looks like. Well, first of all, notice that um, this is the same as the set of vectors spanned by 1, 0, negative 1. So it's a one-dimensional space. It's a line. And if we try to represent that, we try to get a feel for what this looks like, here's our xy coordinate system. The kernel consists of scalar multiples of the vector that live on 1, 0, negative 1. So if we come out 1 in the x direction, 0 in the y, and then we go down 1 in the z, we're kind of pointing out down that direction and then back into the paper. So the kernel lives along that line. OK. Next, we wanted to find the range. So we wanted to find the range of the transformation. And I'll write down the transformation again because it's good to take a look remember what numbers we are working with because we've done so many things between now and originally seeing the problem. Uh, we've got x plus z and y. Now certainly the range of t is a subset of r2. 
and just looking at this sort of output it's a little bit hard to determine exactly what kind of output we get and so we're going to use some of the tools related to the rank nullity theorem um, to get a better handle on what the range really looks like okay so let's come back to this question I'm going to leave a little bit of space in our paper and go to the next question um, which had to do with the rank nullity theorem and writing a T as a matrix so let's start with that So we're trying to write T as a matrix and there's really three steps. We need to write a basis for the domain of T, which in this case was uh, R3. And so our basis for R3 looks like 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. So that's a really good basis to work with for R3. Step two, apply the linear transformation, apply T to the basis elements. So let's do that. The first application will go T of 1, 0, 0. And again, let's remind ourselves what T does. T is a map that takes in vectors x, y, z, and it spits out vectors that look like x plus z comma y. So if we're putting in a 1, 0, 0, what we'll get out is a 1 plus 0 comma 0. So we get out a 1, 0. And then the next application of the transformation to basis element we're going to put in a 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so now x is 0, y is 1, so we're going to get 0 plus 0, and we get out 1, so that gives us a 0, 1. And lastly, we'll go t applied to 0, 0, 1, and if we put those values in here, 0, 0, 1, we get 1, 0. So those three column vectors become matrix A. Matrix A has column vectors obtained in step two. So here comes matrix A. Matrix A looks like one, zero, 0, 1, and a 1, 0. So a couple of questions here. First of all, what is the rank of A? The rank of A tells us about the dimension of the range of T because the rank and the range, those rank of t tells us exactly what the dimension is. And we notice here that the rank of this matrix A is 2. Some other things to notice here. Um, we have a free variable column here, so let's write that down. So the dimension of the null space or the nullity nullity of A that's the same as the dimension of the null space it's the same as the dimension of the kernel of T these all mean the same thing and we see that we have one free variable So the dimension of the kernel is 1. We also see that the number of columns of A, that's the same as the dimension of the domain 
of t. Now we already knew that the domain of t was r3, so we already knew that the dimension was 3, but it's just nice to verify that. And we can see that the rank nullity theorem, rank plus nullity equals the dimension of the domain, that certainly holds here. And it's a good double check that all our calculations are correct. So the rank was 2, the nullity was 1, and the dimension of the domain is 3. So that all works together. All right, so let's go back and answer this question that we left off with up above. And we were kind of scratching our heads here, wondering about the range of t. And we said we'd come back to this. So let's do that. Based on our analysis below, so based on the analysis of matrix A, we found that the rank of A was 2. And that's the same as, so this implies, that the dimension of the range of T is also 2. Those are the same things, the rank and the dimension of the range. So look at, we have the range of T as a subset of R2. We know that has to happen. We also know that the dimension of the range is 2. And the only dimension 2 subspace of R2 is all of R2. So that tells us here that our range of t is all of R2. And there's other ways to determine that, but I think this is a really nice way using some of the theory we've developed so far.